Hey guys, welcome back to the Mac TV Project. Now that we have a pretty good handle on the distortion issues, I want to get back to finishing things up, uh, cosmetically, that is. So I took the picture tube out and I'm cleaning up now and uh, experimenting a little bit with cleaning the chassis. So I used Gojo previously on a little spot over here and it worked well, but I found that I could go back over and, and wipe it down a little bit later and some black residue kept coming off and um, somebody left me a comment that that could be because there's uh, a caustic agent like lye perhaps in the gojo which can um, cause a reaction with metal and that could probably be what's going on so I thought I'd try something different on this now uh, I had a friend uh, give me some advice for cleaning jewelry and said, hey, you know, it's jewelry cleaner is basically CLR. So I thought I'd give that a try on the chassis. It works incredibly well. And there's no residue. I did this a while ago. I'm not getting black crud coming off. does a real nice job on all the surfaces. The cadmium plated steel. These little uh, heads here. Um... I imagine those are steel or brass or something. Well, at least they look kind of brassy colored after the CLR anyways. And it's not reacting or harming anything. So I think that's the way to go because it's pretty benign stuff. And um, once I'm done with that, I'll just wipe it down with some uh, water and paper towels and, and call that done. Clean up the tubes. I'm going to put as many of the original tubes back in. I mostly have already. Uh, remount the CRT and then finish up all the stuff with the the electrolytic um, covers and so on. And then see about can we mount this guy somewhere else. All I'm doing is getting a little bit on a toothbrush and. Gently brushing it on. Wait a few moments and then wipe it off. That's really all it takes, at least on this chassis. How about that? I finished cleaning up the chassis with CLR, reinstalled all the tubes. They're mostly all the original tubes it came with, all the mirror tone and mech branded tubes. Just had to replace two of the 6AU6s and one of the 12SN7s because they tested poorly. Filter choke is back in the set, all the extra filter caps have been removed. The filament transformer for the tuner is still out. I am feeding in a signal directly from the TVA92 into the grid of the video amp and we have our nice clean distortion free test pattern. So that is our starting point now for what do we do about this. So the fact that we have a great looking image now means there's no ripple and the power supply affecting the deflection amps or anything like that. We know that all the problems are from the video amp to the antenna, somewhere in the middle there. And we definitely know that the orientation of that transformer is a problem. So where can we put it? Thought about putting it underneath. Originally it was mounted right above this point. There's not quite enough clearance down in here too worried about it bumping into some of the stuff. There's AC line voltage present here. I don't want to mess with that. Um, potentially I could drill a couple holes in the side of the chassis and mount it over here. But uh, we don't know that that would solve the problem. So let's keep it on top of the chassis for now. We have a few options. Originally it was mounted here. We could possibly go here here, one of the original holes, and drill another hole, mount it something like that. Let's see, is there enough room here? Possibly. Near the rectifier tubes, maybe it could be squeezed in there. 
otherwise way over here which in the service info is where they show the speaker being mounted I'm torn. If I keep it over here, that makes things easier because I have easy access to the uh, 120 volts AC and D for the primary. It's close to where it was originally. I can run the leads of the tuner down here. Um, so I'll, I'll try that first. Let's try the simplest thing first. But it sure did seem during my test like if I rotated it 90 degrees from where it was originally, that reduced the distortion considerably. There's enough room to do it. Could also go more towards the front. So it also seemed like the, f the closer to the front, the better it was because it's more sensitive to um, interference the further back it is than uh, towards the front. Because by the time you get here, the electron beam has already been accelerated considerably. It's got more energy. It's harder to deflect. Oh, and I did uh, twist up the wires going to the speaker. I don't think it really matters, but it helps keep them uh, from flopping around quite so much. Here's a transformer. I twisted up the primary tightly with the aid of a heat gun on low. Helps to soften up the old uh, insulation, and I have that wired in. Also twisted up the secondary and added an extension that, that's twisted up and goes down below. I left things kind of ragged for now because I just want to find out is this is even going to work in this position. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to say that uh, it is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's way better than it was before. It's a little bit of a horizontal distortion. It's working its way up. But that's way, way, way less than it was before. Similarly, there's a tiny amount of vertical distortion. Uh, I can rotate this transformer a little bit the way I have it mounted. So this is closer to how it was originally. Not quite. Um, yeah, I don't have enough lead to get it. So now it's at about 45 degrees to the CRT. And this, so the distortion's a little bit more. And I'm rotating it more like 90 degrees. And you see, the, see how it wiggles a little one as I rotate the transformer. I can live with that. I can live with that. I spent some time tweaking all the controls and fiddling with the fine tuning and the tuner and finally settled on the 6AG5 does seem to give better performance in the 6AU6, even though it came with a 6AU6 in the socket, so we'll go with the 6AG5. A really good sound. As usual, it's better in a dim room. Hopefully that wasn't enough to get me flagged for copyright violations. I'll give you another little taste from The set being off. The sink is uh, really solid. Um, just turn it on and it's, it's locked in. So all things considered, not too bad. As always, I have to be careful how much broadcast programming I show or I'll get flagged for a copyright violation. Now, I have to say, I am impressed with how well this set plays, considering it's not just a budget set, it's a low-end budget set. I don't think I've ever seen a vintage TV that had no shielding on any of the IF or detector tubes. Nor are the IF transformers shielded. They must have figured the, them being underneath the chassis would be insufficient. I don't know, but uh, hey... It's working now. That's that's the important thing. And probably would have been here sooner if I had paid more attention to the comments a number of you left about focusing on this guy. Uh, but I will say, in my defense, I haven't spent as much time on this as you might think, even though weeks have gone by because I've been working on other things like building a new workbench, and I'm currently working on no less than four predicted TVs on the workbench right now. Uh, 
I'm also glad that I got to do some experimenting, learn some more troubleshooting skills. Very happy with the addition of the Suncor TVA-92. I'm sure we'll be using that in future projects. I'm also amazed at how well that CLR worked on cleaning up the chassis. So we are just about done. We uh, need to clean up that ugly splice, mount this transformer more securely by drilling another hole here, and uh, finally finishing up these cardboard covers, and that should just about do it. While we still have this set out, uh, I thought it was worth taking one last look at some things, now that the picture's looking a lot better, and one is the video amp. Essentially, uh, no ripple. Certainly uh, less than there was before, considerably. If you remember before, it was like half ripple. It's dominated it. And then similarly, the sync pulses are clean. So, rotating that transformer did more than just contain magnetic fields getting into the cathode ray tube. It was somehow getting hum into the video, which again makes me think, wonder about all these unshielded coils very near that transformer. Or is there a defect in the transformer, as several of you have speculated, like shorted winding, some issue with the case, and putting pressure on it in different ways has altered it? Maybe. Uh, I'm glad it's working. <laughs> and working quite well, so uh, I'm not going to push my luck uh, by exploring it any further. The other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is the insane high voltage power supply. I think I've touched on this once or twice before. I think it worth, it's worth delving into a little bit further. So we've talked about the power supply. That it's got a B minus, it's got a B plus, it's got a B plus plus, which is the output of a tripler. There is another supply in the mix. It's strange though, so these two lines that disappear for a moment and then continue on down here. Inside this dashed faded line here, that is the high voltage generator. That's where it gets its power from. These two wires coming in and then the output on that side. Well, what are these two wires? One is going to the AC plug and the other is going to the negative side of an electrolytic capacitor. What the heck? <laughs> uh, and and that, uh, that line off of one side of the AC line actually goes to the cathode on one, of, one half of the 12SN7 inside there. So we've got one side of the AC line going to the negative side of two electrolytic capacitors up here. And the positive goes down to the circuit. So what is going on here? It's actually the voltage doubler. They're picking off some voltage from that. But it's not reference to ground. It's reference to the AC line. So this capacitor has AC on both sides of it, positive and negative, with reference to ground. But with respect to each other, they don't. I've never seen something used quite like that. What's even weirder too is, and see this dashed box here, that's the filament for the tube in there. So <laughs> one side of the AC line is both going to the 12SN7 filament and it's going around to the cathode on it. Let me see if I can get the scope on that cap and show you the AC on both sides and then, because it's floating, we should be able to put the scope right across it. There is the positive side of one of those electrolytic capacitors. And here is the other electrolytic. Nuts. And here is the negative side. Huge AC waveform. What about, I'm going to turn the set off when I do this because i got to be poking on the AC line. I'm going to put my scope 
The set is floating, so they're isolated from each other. I'm going to put this essentially on one side of the AC line and this on the positive side of the cap. And instead of that huge sine wave, we should just have clean DC. All right, cooked up the scope, turning the set back on. Sets up and running, straight line. I have it in AC mode, so we're not getting any deflection. I'll throw it up in DC mode. I figure it's kind of at the edge of the scope's functionality, but that is a very large DC voltage. I've never seen something quite like that where they have electrolytic caps going from the AC, it's one side of the AC line, or basically with AC on both sides of the cap, but in reference to each other, it's, there's like zero ripple. That's crazy. I should clarify that statement a little. Yes, I've seen AC and electrolytic capacitors. After all, that's how a voltage doubler works. You have, you have to have that alternating voltage in order to, to build it up. However, even though there's alternating voltage on the positive and the negative side of this cap, it never goes negative on the positive side with respect to the negative side of the cap. In other words, there's never reverse polarity on that cap. There's just alternating voltages on both sides. What I haven't ever seen though is where they tap into kind of the middle of the voltage doubler and pick off two voltages and feed that into a circuit to power it. What I'm used to seeing is them taking the output of that uh, voltage doubler and filtering it with respect to ground so you get nice clean DC. So why didn't they do that? We have B plus and B plus plus why isn't there a third voltage mentioned in here? Why didn't they filter this? They can't. They need to have AC going from the doubler to feed the tripler. And then the output of the tripler has uh, more filtering on it with respect to ground. I should clarify that statement a little bit. Yes, of course I've seen AC and electrolytic capacitors before. After all, that's how a voltage doubler works. You have to have AC on the electrolytic caps. However, there's alternating voltage on both sides of the cap that track each other and it's never reverse polarity. The positive side of the cap is always more positive than the negative side of the cap. What I'm not used to seeing is them sort of tapping into the middle of the voltage doubler and powering a circuit from it. What I'm more used to seeing is they take the output of the voltage doubler and they filter it, like down here for B+, where there's a electrolytic and maybe a filter choke and other electrolytic and get nice clean DC out. So right here is the output of the voltage doubler. There's no filtering, there's no filter cap going to ground. Why not? They can't because it has to feed the tripler and that has to have AC on it and then the output of this gets all the nice filtering. But they don't filter the output of the voltage doubler they filter the output of the first rectifier, they filter the output of the third rectifier, but they don't filter the output of the second rectifier with respect to ground. That's a little weird. All right, I hope that made some sort of sense. <laughs> now back to finishing up this set. Uh, one thing I like about Sam's is they include photos of the set and they label the controls. So this set was missing its back. I know what the back should look like now. So I can cut that out of masonite, which should be cool. But they also label the controls. There are no uh, markings on the chassis, so I had to have something like this so I know what the linearity was and the height and the width. And those are the last few things I want to check. I thought I had it pretty good until I was reviewing some of the footage I shot of the set playing. And I see it needs a little bit of tweaking. There's a little bit of fold over at the uh, edges of it horizontally, and I think the vertical linearity needs a little bit of tweaking. Now, unfortunately, the horizontal linearity is a control underneath the chassis, so I have to adjust that while it's out of the cabinet and the set is on its side. Also, the tubes play a big role in the height and the width and the linearity, and I've been playing musical chairs with the tubes trying to find the best combo, and I think I'm still lacking a little width right now, so... I've been trying to retain the original tubes as much as possible, but I think I'm going to have to replace another one of them to get the width up to what it should be. All right, so 
Here we are down at the new workbench. You'll be seeing a lot more of this in the very near future. Right now, I just finished cutting some new cardboard inserts for the damaged capacitor covers. I used this nifty little craft uh, circle cutter. It's like a compass with an X-Acto blade in it. Went over some uh, card stock um, by trial and error. Got the diameter right and then uh, popped in three of them. Yeah, there's a small hole in the middle from the center of that point. I'll uh, trim that down and fill it in with something and then I'll mix up some uh, paint and uh, do the best color matching job I can do on that. And I'll try to touch up this charred one a little bit, and we'll call it done. No, they're not perfect, not by any stretch, but it'll do for now. Uh, they're being preserved. I photographed them at some point. Someone could uh, make new ones completely if they wanted to. But I figured it was more important to preserve the originals than to uh, try fabricating replicas. Since all the printing is still so nice. I'm working on putting the chassis back in the cabinet and a few things cropped up. One, uh, I thought I had the picture all squared away. Earlier I had measured the opening on the front of the cabinet, I drew an outline with a marker, and I figured if I got the image to fit that I'd be good. However, when I put this in the cabinet I realized that there is no actual like molded mask that fits tightly to the CRT, it's just a cutout in the front of it, and you can kind of see around the edges, and you really do need to fill up quite a bit of the CRT face to make it look right so you really have to go about like the entire width of the front and get quite a bit of height. I had to play musical chairs with the tubes yet again and then I actually had to decrease the high voltage a little bit which they mentioned in the service info that you might have to do and that's not unique to this set. The more high voltage you have accelerating an electron beam the more voltage you need on the deflection plates to kick it side to side and top to bottom and there's only so much voltage when you can get out of these tubes so when that's not enough you need to just drop the high voltage a little bit which makes the picture a little bit dimmer not tremendously if you have a fresh CRT but it's a drag it's a trade-off you have to drop the brightness a little bit to get to fill the whole screen all right so that's finally done uh, I washed the knobs they are cheap they look better. I used some warm dish detergent and a toothbrush. I sh I'll probably really have to go over with some plastic polish to get them looking nice. But they're scuffed. They're scraped. Some of the uh, inlaid painting is, has worn off. But, eh, you know, they are what they are. They're kind of cheapish knobs. Uh, it's not really, they're not Bakelite. It's uh, some sort of a early type of plastic. Um, and then there's the cabinet. Boy, I, I'm sure when I, if I go back to part one of this project, I noticed this, um, but I just didn't remember. There's only a speaker grill on one side. Uh, even though from the front of it looks like the speaker could go on either side, the speaker has to go on this side. Even though in the service info they show it over here, in this model with this cabinet, you have to have the speaker over here. So all me temporarily putting it over here was... a waste of time it has to go over here if i hadn't messed with it if i hadn't taken it off i wouldn't have damaged the cone <laughs> you live and learn um, and functionally i think it makes more sense to have it over here that's where your channel control is and if you're sitting next to the tv it just kind of seems right however from an engineering standpoint it makes way more sense over here because that's the audio output tube and there's already enough going on over here with the power supply and the tuner. Why well, clutter it up? But aesthetically, <laughs> with this cabinet, uh, it has to go there. All right. Um, so I think I'm finally at the point now where I can slide this into the cabinet. So, yeah. <laughs> From this side, it basically looks very, very similar. This is the veneer, and there's the underlying wood behind it. But on this side, there's light that comes through. Like, they cut it a little bit deeper, or at an angle, or something. There's no grill cloth or anything. It's just wood and wood. Um, but it's, I guess they just cut it a little deeper on this side. I don't know. About basic as you can get. 
Oh, well, since we're at it, we might as well talk about the cabinet. I'm not going to go and take this off and clean it up even though it needs it because this cabinet needs a lot of work. If you recall, it's been a while, but this cabinet is or has been damaged by someone who apparently was trying to refinish it. I think they used a belt sander or some type of orbital power sander and they ruined every single surface. That really takes some talent. <laughs> they came close to almost not damaging the front, but they did. A little bit down here, but more importantly, up here and over here. What happened? They sanded through the veneer into the underlying wood. It's far worse on the other sides. So every, the, the left side, the, the right side, the top, the front, they all have this damage. Every single surface needs touch-up or re-veneering or something. I just don't know what would have possessed somebody. You'd think the first side they did where they burned through the veneer, they would have stopped. But no, they kept going and damaged every single side. <laughs> Don't use power sanders. Just use... You can, these old finishes or old lacquer finishes come off so easy. You can scrape it off with a metal scraping tool. Or even the mildest stripper will take it. You just use lacquer thinner. Nail polish remover. <laughs> It'll wipe right off. You don't need to get out the power tools. I'm not going to deal with this right now. I thought about trying to touch it up or patch it. That would be way too difficult. I'm just going to re-veneer the whole thing. Now, on the positive side, it's about as basic as basic a cabinet as you can have. It's mahogany veneer, uh, quarter cut, um, probably two or three pieces on each side. It's a little hard to see, but... Probably, I don't think this is just one big sheet of veneer. It's probably a seam somewhere in here. Uh, regardless, uh, I'll just, well, I, should, I was about to say I'll just remove this. Well, we'll see. We'll see how much effort it is involved in removing this. I might just put the new veneer over it. It's already been sanded pretty thin anyways. Except that I can feel a depression here where they sand deeper. It doesn't feather out as smoothly as you might think. You can feel the depression. And you can feel this corner is rounded off. And same over here. Well, we're going to deal with that. Maybe, maybe this spring, this summer. Uh, let's get this all put back together for now as best we can. See what I mean about that pitcher tube? It sits back there a bit, and it's curved, and you can really see around all of the edges, so you need to fill that out. Originally, there may have been a foam gasket around this, and it's just gone, and there's no trace of it left, or this is just how it was. I could perhaps move it forward a little bit if I loosen the mountings, but it, I mean, there were marks left from where it had been installed, and I put it back in the same position, so I'm pretty confident that that is just how it is. Oh, well, the controls are pretty nicely centered, so that's, that's something. <laughs> uh, but boy, that, that's got to be the homeliest set in my collection. <laughs> but I kind of like it. I like it for its just primitive uh, nature. It's been a long, bumpy, unusual ride. <laughs> I sure hope you all enjoyed it and stuck with me through it. It was uh, an interesting process. I thought it would be a quick and easy project, but this does remind me of something. Often the cheapest sets can be the most difficult to uh, restore because they did some tricks, used minimal engineering, maybe they had to carefully select tubes so that everything would work right versus like an over-engineered set, like an RCA 630TS, their flagship first TV with 30 tubes in it. There's a lot of caps to replace. It's kind of a bear, but they work really well because it's a very robust design. This is not a very robust design, hence me having to do things like go through a dozen 12SN7s to get full screen deflection. Goofy power supply, having to orient things right because there's no shielding on anything. <laughs> um, 
But in the end, uh, I think it was rewarding and well worth it. I think this will also be the last time you'll see me in the backup workshop because the new workbench is ready to go. Also want to thank you all for your tips and suggestions and encouragement to help get me through this troublesome project. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Honestly, I'd much rather be alone. Andy, you make them go. Well, 